I want to ask everybody what they thought. The people that heard the confessions on the phone, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was the ones that he made in April, the ones that he made in May, and then I believe there were a couple from June. Mm -hmm. And in each one of those, yep. one of the things that really solidified his mental state overall for me was he kept asking them, I need to know if you're still going to love me. Mm -hmm. You love me regardless. He even, there was one phone call that was actually, it was two phone calls to Kathy on the same day. And he did his confessions and then called her a couple hours later. And his first words were, I need to know if you still love me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't do this and you were just making random confessions, if you were coerced or whatever, you can insert whatever you want into that category. But why would you be so concerned about how your family feels when you know you didn't do it? I he totally really, yeah. yeah. I, I want to add something to that. I am a person who watches body language uh, and facial expressions. And um, one of the things that I noticed when I was in court, when uh, Warden Gallipo was on the stand and he was talking about the, um, the form that Richard Allen filled out the saying that he wanted to he wanted to confess and that he helped to apologize to the families that form as uh, warden Gallopo or Gal however you say his name Gallopo was presenting that information the entire time I watched Richard Allen going nodding and said yes he was in agreement that he filled out that form that's what he said and that he did hope he could apologize to the families and I think that says a lot also, well, I think when I was in court, you know, I was only there one day and I want to just say this, Tom, while I have a minute, hats off to you and Aspen and Susan and Marv and Teddy and Turbo who sat in that courtroom day after day and listened to some of the most horrific evidence in this case being, um, being shown and talked about. I was there one day, you guys, and it absolutely exhausted me emotionally and physically. Yeah. Thank, I'm thankful that I went because I locked eyes with Richard Allen. And when he looked at me, he looked right through me. It was the most, I can't, it was chilling, guys. I, I, all I can say to you is it was a chilling moment for me. And I absolutely know that this is a this is a master manipulator, this person sitting in that seat. And yeah. I believe 100 percent that they've got the right guy. And also, um, just the fact that his confessions were over a 10 month period, writing a right. letter to the warden, calling his wife and mom, saying things to suicide companions. And then the last one that we know, of, February 4th, 2024, a guard was doing his rounds at Wabash. So this is after yes. Rick had moved. He was mm -hmm. crying in his bed, talking to himself and overheard saying, I am sorry for what I did. I am sorry for killing those girls. So I mean, thank just, you. So many confessions over so long, it's suspicious as heck. And he confessed and before psychosis, before he was on yes. 413, I made before a time Before and run. after. Before and after he was yes. Named, yes. having psychosis and psychosis doesn't last the entire time. So yeah, he confessed um, before and after. So that destroys the defense's case right there. April 13th was a pivotal day because that was the day that the multidisciplinary team was formed. It had Dr. Martin, the psychiatrist who administered the Halidol. Uh, Dr. Walla had gone for a sounding board to her superiors, uh, Dr. DeWanger, and I believe it was Dr. Harris or Harris, I couldn't hear quite right. But that was the day that they formed that multidisciplinary team. And in the entire scheme of what has gone on with these um, the timeline for these confessions, it's very important to note these dates. I'm sure Fig and others have, have this all laid out uh, nicely in a document or a spreadsheet or something. But what I, but I, what I would like to just touch on back to these confession calls is I have the dates from that day on day 12 with Dr. Harshman. Um, and call number, I was seated directly behind Kathy Allen on this day. And so I, I could hear 
some of the things that she said, and there wasn't very much. But what, one thing I did note in my notes that I'm looking at right now is that when they played call number one, which occurred on November 14th, 2022, when they first started playing each confession call, we would have the lead in of how much money was on his account. The oh, current yeah. balance is $50. Hello, this is a pre-call from Ricky and it was recorded. And, and when that was playing, you could hear the other inmates in the background mm. of, of him calling. And she leaned over to her friend and she said, that's what I have to listen to all the time. And it was grunting wow. noises of the other inmates. So it was at that time very much about her, right? From my observation, mine only. And I heard her say this as the call was playing. So on November 14th, we had call number one. On, November, uh, on April 22nd, 2022, is call number two to Janice, his mother. Mm -hmm. I noted that... 2023. Sorry, 2023, pardon me. Um, I noticed that Alan was rocking in his chair and that uh, Kathy's friend, Christy, lead with love, was consoling her. I also noted that juror number six who everybody has talked about. He was the, the man in the top row closest to the door. He was looking at Kathy during this time. And then um, call number three was April, that was played for us, was April 3rd, 2023. Okay, and then we went to May 10th, uh, call number one. That was also to Kathy. Uh, call number four was the second call on May 10th at 1115 a.m. Mm -hmm. And that was Kathy again. And I had some notes on what the jurors were doing there, but I won't I won't get into it here now. But just for the timeline, call number five was May 17th, 2023. And that was to Janice Allen at 1022 a.m. And then we had June 5th. Uh, 2023. And after that call in my book, I have it highlighted down the hill. That's a match. It he sounds like BG to me. And that's when I knew because I hadn't been there the day before, unfortunately, when the 13th and the 26th interviews were done and played. So this was the first time that I got to hear him for and Tammy, you and I, I'm Turbo, sorry, you um, and I went and then, over this. So your, mm -hmm. your timeline, mm -hmm. you're saying like when it aligns to when they're saying he's faking it kind of? Or faking the confession? Um, the when he's feigning? Um, well, I did, I actually interpreted all of these calls that they played to, his, to Kathy and Janice, his wife and mother. I interpreted his tone as being quite stable he was a bit emotional okay. in the first couple yeah no i they i did not interpret any of them to uh, as him being in psychosis okay. or what have you um myself i mean that's yeah. you know that's another part of the timeline as to what was going on with him medically well, but call number Wallace six was dr so, Wallace, dr Wallace testified that he was non-psychotic and organized right his at the crime well, Tammy and I talked yes. about this earlier, and Tammy, your point was, because I wrote down exactly mm -hmm. the dates and your timeline's excellent, but you were saying that essentially he was trying to tell his mom and his wife, I did yes. this, no, I did right. this, no. They mm -hmm. wouldn't let him say, I did it, and he wanted to, and then something flipped, if you could talk about that date. Right. So Tom had mentioned earlier that the, um, and, and I believe Tom had said that April 13th was quote, the height of his psychosis, but that's not what I had in my notes. Mm -hmm. I had that that was when they um, they did administer and well, they formed this multidisciplinary team and then he was administered the inv involuntary Haldol and perhaps you guys have the date on that. I wasn't yes, there when Dr. Martin. Was was the date you did a whole timeline on it. They didn't, is it to where you can kind of okay. coincide where maybe he got the discovery? What switch? So April 3rd is when he first called Kathy. And that's what we were talking about 
today, Susan, with respect yeah. to um, he he was not in psychosis when he called his wife, mm -hmm. whom we'd heard multiple bits of testimony about from various doctors that he had this dependent personality. And when he yeah. was when he was confessing to to her specifically, who he had this relationship with, uh, arguably with this codependent or dependent personality, she kicked it all back. She just denied it. And, and, I, and I think, and I mean, I don't know what the testimony was, but it seems to me his, his wife and his mother and anybody who would tell him to, that he was confessing to and to try to stop talking about it, he wasn't being heard when he was finally able to come clean about what he did. And you could argue, uh, I could argue that that's what pushed him to this break, so to speak, this temporary break in his head and where he gets to the point of ne needing an involuntary shot yeah. on the 13th. If and that's the reason I'm asking was. is I'm wondering right now or tomorrow morning when they start deliberating again, they'll be analyzing these calls, right? The dates and, right. and are they gonna believe the defense that he was in psychosis because of solitary. And when you mentioned that the voices in prison, does that mean he's not in solitary? I thought he was in solitary, that you wouldn't hear voices outside. I don't know who can answer that. Well, if you remember in the testimony about um, Cass County versus in the closing arguments that Nick made, um, he talked about how, um, he talked about how, you know, that he had he had people nearby that he could speak to in Westville and Wabash um, that, you know, he would talk to the walls, that he would talk to people. And he, he kind of listed out a whole bunch of things that, you know, basically show that his conditions were not any less isolated in Cass County as they have been in Westville right. and, and Wabash. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the things he said is that he did have neighbors that he could, mm -hmm. you know, that he could speak to. <clears throat> And I just want to point out um, here, my um, my my judge friend, he said to remind everyone whenever I talk about this, it doesn't matter what Richard Allen's mental health is incarceration. When he's incarcerated, that doesn't matter at all. What matters is what was his mental health on February 13th, 2017, when he was mm -hmm. out there at the bridge. Was he in psychosis that day? Was he crazy? How was he living? What was he doing during that time? Was he being medicated? Was he being seen? No, he was working. He was holding down a job. He was he was being himself, you know? So um, that's why the prosecution has to say he's bridge guy. And that's why the defense has yeah. to make sure he's not bridge guy. So it yes. boils down to that. Do you believe he's bridge guy? And Steve, how do you think this is gonna turn out <laughs> if you had a crystal ball, I guess? Right. And in psychosis, you don't know right from wrong. And the fact that he covered the bodies knows that he knows right from wrong. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he wanted to try to conceal. They could explain bodies. anything away with onus oh, right. sticks and garages. I don't know. They're just trying to get their guy not to be bridge guy because they know if he's bridge guy, he's guilty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're doing their job, right? I so think. Time on the bridge, someone saw him on the bridge. He said he went out to the bridge, dressed like bridge guy. I don't know how people could think he's not bridge guy. I yeah. right. And I know that yeah. I tested it now with two people, Tom and Turbo. Um, the first platform was much further than 50 feet from the, from the beginning of the bridge. Exactly. I'm just grateful they are sequestered. I'm truly grateful. I've never been mm -hmm. more grateful. And I've never been more grateful that they are not selected from the county that we're in. And, you know, and now they, we have they were from Allen County. Now. I'm grateful. So I just wanted to ask. Steve, what do you think overall in assessment to this? Let's imagine that no one was on that trail that day. That um, on the 14th, two young children were found in the woods. No one uh, was there the day before. Who would be in jail? Who would currently be in jail uh, right now on what was has been presented to law enforcement and probable cause? There's only one individual that has checked every box. That he went to law enforcement. If you if you took everybody else off of the chart and you only had him, who is the one individual that says, I was there that day. I was on the platform. I didn't see the girls, but I saw a white van during a uh, critical, during the moments of the commission of the crime. So if we took everything else away, 
and we only look at what one individual has brought to the table, that where would we be and what would our uh, understanding of what the likelihood of a conviction would be. And um, that's where I think we're headed, that you could take everybody else's testimony away and just go by what Richard Allen has uh, admitted to, uh, the totality of that day, mm -hmm. uh, even from having lunch or leaving, having lunch with his mother and sisters and traveling, that everything is supporting that we have one offender that was there that day that committed a absolutely horrendous crime. And we can all debate about like the confessions and whether he did them because of conditions at Westville, but it, what matters is what he was doing on February 13th, 2017. And he first said in the first two days, I was there, I arrived at 1.30, which totally adds up to the 127 Hoosier Harvester camera, parking at CPS, passing these girls who he said, he thought they looked like sisters and the girls who saw Bridge Guy were sisters, like three out of the four. Then he goes to platform one, Betsy Blair sees Bridge Guy on platform one, his, his new 130 timeline to me does not add up, and that's like the major reason why I would vote guilty. Plus and also with, with Betsy Blair, too, I wasn't aware of this before, but she said that she knew what time she was there because she had her Fitbit information. So that does yep. add to locking in the timeline of yeah, when she, she was out there. And... She was captured on Hoosier Harvester video arriving at Mears at 12.02 and then leaving at 1.15 to go use the bathroom at the library. And she so she twice. passed his CPS at 115. No mention of seeing Richard Allen's car at 115. But at 215, when she left for good, she saw a car that she thought resembled her father's from the 1960s. Well, what, why didn't she see Rick's car at 115 if he was there until 130? The same reason why people saw two other different cars at the same location around the same time, because eyewitness testimony usually sucks. Yes, so, five minutes before that at 210, some man described it as a purple PT cruiser in the same spot against the um, CPS. And if building. you guys don't right. follow Greg Hughes, he maps out with a map and a timeline very specifically because it is hard to follow, especially if you're not as familiar with the case, but he maps it out kind of where they were at what specific time. So mm -hmm. if that's all you want to believe, that is why Nick McClellan said in the opening and then the closing, he is bridge guy. He put himself there. And I wonder, though, with the four counts, right, there's four counts, what they're discussing. We'll never really know. We can assess. But tomorrow, Monday, I'm, I'm wondering, will they come back with a verdict? And I'm hoping for one, I guess.